Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the press conference of the film El Gran Feyove will be uh, has a special screening within the official selection of the 68th Film Festival here in San Sebastian. To talk with the about the film, we've got a, we've got the following people. We've got Carlos Rossini, the DOP, Carlos Osa, producer, Cristina Velasco, producer as well. And the director, Mr. Matt Dillon, who is, it's a pleasure to have here once again, by the way, in San Sebastian. So, so thank you very much for being here. And now let's go directly, let's cut to the chase for the, to the question. So whoever wants to ask a, a question, please raise your hand and we'll give you a microphone. I hope you can hear me, Mr. Dillon. Good. Okay, there's a question there, it seems. He's speak, she's speaking English. Um, I need to, to do the, the obvious question, how, how all this came up and why this particular figure you chose to, to do a film about? Um, yeah, it's, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it was really a very organic uh, process, the way it came to be. Um, I didn't really set out to make a documentary about him. It just sort of evolved. And, and the, where it really began was way back in the last century, the end of the last century, 1999, um, when uh, I discovered his music and I introduced it to uh, the music to a very good friend of mine who w was somebody that it really, the, I'd say that it really was born out of that friendship that we had and that bond that we had over the same type of music. And um, and that's where it all began. I, I told him about Feove, and then he went and made a record with him. He found him at 77 years old, this kind of semi-retired, uh, incredible performer who was living in Mexico City in exile from Cuba for, since 1955, really. And I was very pleasantly surprised that he actually tracked him down and, uh, and then you know, we started talking, and next thing you know, I was I, I was there with him, filming the making of that last record of of Feove. So that's that's where it all began, and then and then it wasn't wasn't really sure what to do with the footage, although I thought I thought it was amazing because he was amazing, and he was just a joy to be around. It's such a colorful, it's like the kind of person that walks down the street and your head turns because he's such a a kind of uh, his, just this exuberant musical personality. And I knew it was great, but I didn't know exactly what to do with it. And so therefore, it, it sat for a while. And maybe that was a good thing uh, in, to a certain extent. But that, that's, the way it, that's the way it all came to be. And then, of course, it wasn't until uh, many years later that I re, that I we re jump started the project, and really with Carlos Sosa here, uh, Carlos and I met. I, actually, he he reminded me we first met here in Spain in Albacete, and I said Albacete. to him, I said you're Mexican. <laughs> 2008. Was that long ago? And I said, do you know Feove? What what happened that we're there? And then we met later in Guadalajara and talked about it some more. Bueno, me, nos conocimos en una cena con barri. We met. With Lady Barriga at a dinner, I said, hey, "Let me introduce you to a Mexican." Yeah, you're Mexican. You're, do you know Fayove? I didn't I have no idea who Fayove is, and and therefore the issue of Fayove was in the back of my mind. And we met in Guadalajara, and we talked about the issue again. But it was two years later that we met in New York. I was a partner with Christina. After we met in Guadalajara, I was partners with Christina already, and that's that. No, we saw in New York City. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and it was just sort of process, and and at that time I had sort of, you know, the the, the the idea of the film evolved, and so the discovery happened in the process of making the film, and at one time, at that point, I was I knew the film was going to be include this incredible footage of Feove and everything, but that it would maybe be about uh, the bigger picture of 
Cuban, Cubans immigrating to Mexico. This story that really hadn't been told. Mm -hmm. And then of course, when I got back down to, when I got to Mexico after all this time, it became clear that that story was the story of El Gran Feove. And then it became very clear that that was our story, you know. And um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit like about that part of it was, was that uh, I had asked Carlos, I said, hey man, uh, I know he's living in a home, but I don't know where could you find him. And then he was able to find him and met him and he was very old. And I knew I wouldn't film him in that particular state that he was in. But uh, you know, I know that he he'd been asking about me, and he and when I said that state, he, his health had deteriorated. He was getting quite old. You know, he was 89, and he had health health uh, issues. You know, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, things like this. And uh, so Carlos <laughs> Carlos found him there, and uh, he reached out to me and said, "Hey, uh, I found him, and he remembered you, right? I mean, what what?" Uh, you want me to tell you the story? <laughs> yeah, sure. You, you go ahead. He was in an old person's home, and I arrived at the, the old person's home. I said it was impossible to see him. And I said, okay, well, I can't see him. So I said, thank you very much, and see you later. And I was leaving, and a nurse, I said, let me see him, please. I talked to her, and the nurse let me through the back door, and I entered, and I saw him, and he was quite older, and he had uh, senile dementia, and so therefore... I said, I'm a friend of Matt Dillon. He wants to come along. And he says hello to you. And he started to shake and his eyes started to get to lighten up. He said, Madilo, Madilo, Madilon. And three days later, Matt turned up. And I talked to Matt and I said, This has got to be right away. We've got to do it now. Uh, so by the time I got, when I got down there, because it's, uh, Carlos told me that he's, he's not doing too well, so if you want to see him, which I did, uh, he better come quick. So I got down there, and, and, you know, he'd been living in a really interesting place. It was called the Casa de Actor, and it was created by Contin Flas, who, was, uh, who decided to start this actor's home when he saw uh, actors that he knew from television panhandling in front of the theater. And he became alarmed and said, I have to do something for my fellow actors. So Feove had been living there for about five years. But when I got down there, because of his deterioration of his health, he got moved to the, to the, uh, to the regular hospital. And, uh, you know, and that was a very, you know, uh, it was difficult, you know, to, to, to have that. But, but I did do some interviews with some of the people who experienced this time with the Cubans in exile and the Mexican musicians working together. And they all spoke about Feove, you know? And that's when it became very clear to me that that was what this film was. It was his journey. And that journey became a porthole, uh, a, a, a doorway into the history, that, that history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question in the front. To Matt Dillon, in the beginning of the film, you talk about your fascination for uh, Cuban music and your desire to, to, to collect uh, kind of rare records and discover people. Could you, could you tell us a bit more how this all started? Um, I mean, this is not the conventional American musical taste. Um, so um, how did you get into this? It's American. <laughs> But how did you get into the special appreciation uh, of this kind of music exactly, which was not following kind of the, the great names, but discovering new people? Well, you know, again, it was, I never, since I was 12 years old, I always bought records. I didn't think of myself as a record collector, but more somebody that just liked music. And, you know, my musical taste evolved tastes evolved and I developed curiosities about music and being in New York, uh, New York is, I mean, it's, you know, a big Latin community, lots of Afro-Cuban music, Puerto Rican music, salsa. This is the, one of the great cradles of this kind of music and 
So eventually when I did discover that music, because it was around me and everywhere, and when it, when it hooked me, I really became, I, be, I, I wasn't really interested <laughs> in any other kind of music. I'm being honest about it. I mean, I, of course, I, like, I love all kinds of music, but Cuban music especially hooked me. And, uh, and I didn't set out to become like a record collector or something. It's just something that happens because, you know, you know, uh, Willie tells you about, and Queens tells you about Salam in the Bronx, and he's got these records and he wants to sell them, and you go and you want to buy two records, and he says, I only want to sell the whole collection. And you're like, okay. So you end up amassing, these and they become a collector. And then you discover that sometimes the only way to find it is on record, you know? And then it becomes fun. It becomes this, the hunt, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the back, we have another question. Yes, the boy in blue. Questions for Matt Dillon from Rodrigo from Brazil. Uh, Matt, let me ask you something. Uh, 18 years ago, you directed an incredible movie, City of Ghosts. How useful was that experience in Felovis documentary? And another question: How different is the New York City you filmed from today's New York City when we think about the Latin American artist that lives there? Ooh, those are a few questions, and uh, thank you. I'm really glad you liked the movie City of Ghosts that I made. <laughs> and, and you know, it eh, documentaries are tough. <laughs> it's it's another creature, as Christina, and Carlos, and uh, Carlos Rossini. They can tell you. Uh, Carlos Rossini is in the middle of making one himself now, so I empathize with him. And I think the difference is really th that you don't have uh, the script. Is and, and one of my editors is here, Chompies, Armando Croda, and he can tell you, and, and Lindsay, they both worked on the film. You really are, your script is, it's in the material that you have. And it's, it's really, uh, it's difficult. And, you know, finding, finding the balance. But obviously having had a lot of experience as an actor really helped me when I made City of Ghosts. So. It wasn't as if I hadn't been on a movie set before. So it, it was a similar thing here. But it really, the, the documentary gets made in the editing room, but it gets made throughout. And I didn't understand that. So when I, when I filmed in 1999, I, when I filmed this, this footage in 1999, it never occurred to me, hello, that I could have gone back and that I can go back. And that's what the beauty of making a documentary is. You don't need a big team. You don't need, you could set, you could go any, you could, I mean, uh, uh, Rossini and I, we went and, and, and did one interview. We went to Merida in Mexico just to do an interview with one, one artist, uh, Tony Camargo. And, and that's the way, I, I th that's how it developed for me. And I think we are in a golden age of documentaries. Documentaries are very much often, as exciting, if not more exciting, than the narrative films. And I'm an actor, so I don't mean to like, <laughs> you know, but I have to say, I find it to be the case. And, uh, and so, you know, this journey that we took, and I really love that it's these four guys, these three people with me here right now, because we were there together when we started on this project, when we re-jump-started this project back in uh, 19, uh, in, back in uh, whenever it was, 2013 or whatever. Twelve. Mm. Carlos and Cristina. Carlos and Cristina, would you like to add a few words? Well, it was great to learn from Matt's work uh, the way how he gets close to his uh, characters. It was intimidating all the know-how of uh, bomb music and the characters, the history of Cuba, the story of history of Mexico. So there were very many different layers of uh, knowledge that uh, were interweaved when uh, approaching uh, the characters. I remember Matt had Matt Matt had photos here that he found through research or photos that were provided by other characters or musicians. 
and he sat down and he said, he is so-and-so, and he is so-and-so. So he was talking about all the people that appeared in the photos. Then he picked up another photo. He knew everyone was on the photos and how they had met and on what date they had s recorded what song. And, but he also said that with a familiarity and na so natural as if someone opens up your family <laughs> photo album and he's telling you how these people grew up. And so therefore there was a very beautiful and warm approach to the characters, which I think it gives it touch of familiarity, I think the treatment of the documentary is something which, which doesn't have an expert approach, but it's more as I'm going to tell you the story of something that I feel and that I live and that may, may make you feel passionate. And that's what the Grand Fayove, I think Matt did something very beautiful, with, who knows about music, he knows about the battles of life of the artists and how they've survived. So I think it's a very empathic piece and I thought it was a pleasure to be able to contribute to it. Dina, I mean, one of the things that I had, when I was with Faye right, in 1999, and I loved him, he was a joy to be around. But I would say to him, listen, I need some materials from you about your past because I only had a handful of records to go on, you know, that he had made. And, um, you know, he gave me some color Xerox of the record covers, that was about it because he didn't, he had all that material, but it didn't mean anything to him, because he was always, he was a future thinking guy. I mean, when uh, some of his contemporaries were doing Buena Vista Social Club revival material, he wanted to go out and make a rap record, you know? He wanted to do different things. And then when I got down there, you know, and I met the woman who became his manager, uh, she said, Matt, you've gotta come, I have all this material of him and we and Christine and I went down and she had in the attic was dusty boxes of photographs and letters from his family and sheet music and everything and it was like there was this revelation and I said if I'd only had this material earlier and uh, it really it was it was really an interesting moment uh, I don't think my lungs recovered yeah, from, <laughs> from all the from dust we inhaled. And, and, and would you say, Matt, that some, somehow from, from discovering that luggage, I think it was an old luggage full of letters and mm -hmm. pictures and records, and you kind of rewrote part of the documentary from that information, right? Somehow. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I had always had, because I, when Feovi spoke to me about this man, and I know maybe you're not that familiar with the most incredible bolero uh, composer and singer Jose Antonio Mendez who was you know from his account was somebody that was very uh, very important person like a, an important friend and then I, when I was able to see the letters and pictures that that was the man who brought him to Mexico and I knew that relationship was important and that was and on that there there were the pictures of them and I hadn't seen them and you know, so I, listen, I'm a bit of a nerd. You know, I love gathering information. But, you know, I will say that I learned something about, and this goes back to the gentleman from Brazil's question about the difference in making documentaries and feature films, is that information is palatable to audiences when you feel for the people that you're telling a story about. And so that was the approach became emotion first the man, the person, and then you can, and then people will, they want, they'll, they're all in. They're gonna wanna know about the history, the music, the data, the information, but you have to really feel a connection for the people. No sé si Carlos. Carlos, uh, would you like to add anything to all of this? No, nothing. Since we talked, this was 20, 12, 12, 2012, in Los Cabos, I remember we were having a dinner because I, I just premiered a film. We sat down to have a chat and we didn't stop talking for hours. And then all of a sudden he tells me the story of Feo and I said, it can't be. It's as if he's talking about something that's happening now. And that feeling of presence, of being in the present, I thought it was a film that had to be told about many things that had happened in the past, but in the, in the feeling of the present. And that's what the journalist from the Brazil was asking. He says, this idea that how you tell a story and the camera positioning and, and the camera work in this film makes that you're living it all the time, all the time. time. 
So therefore, he got me into a journey with the music and a journey with the camera to be able to work in many different places, which was incredible. Yes, and it was like, pooh, some of the camera work was pretty heavy on, as if you were on set, really. They're asking for a focus puller. I could use a focus puller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would love that. <laughs> Congratulations, because it's marvelous that you can al allow us to get to know divine, these great musicians and base it upon the synergies that take place during the recording of the, of the record because there's chocolate, feyove, there's a, there's a shock, there's a collision of egos there. So I thought it was a great advantage that feyove didn't know who you were, for example, as an actor, an international actor as you are, and above all, what type of energy did you feel? Because on, this, on the film, it's great, the energy you can see when they're recording uh, the record. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, Literally, when I arrived, we were, there was a group of young people. We're all just like excited to meet this guy because we all were familiar with his music. And Joey had put together a super group of young Cuban musicians and in, down in, living in Mexico City. So they took the same journey Feovi did all these years later. And um, when he came, he was just so accommodating to everybody because he was just so excited. He hadn't made a record in 20 years. And here he was, he was, get, he was gonna be rehearsing for yeah. this first thing experience that he had. And he was accommodating to me and to the cameraman, and, but he had no idea who I was. He just thought I was part of the crew and that he was there to prepare for his record. And I was the guy getting in the way, you know? I was just like, well, he's a nice guy, but who is this guy? He thought I was part of the crew, you know, the, the, the cable wrangler kind of thing. And, uh, then people told him that actually, no, he's a big fan of your music and he's the one who introduced uh, the Joey to the, the project. And then he developed these expectations that maybe this was gonna be this renewed interest in his career. And, you know, this is not somebody who had any, he had the spirit of a child, you know, like, I mean, a very serious man. I mean, I mean that, he was a very serious guy. But when he walked in the room, I mean, it was just this exuberance, joy, and musicality coming from him. But he so I think he, you got it. In 1999, Buena Vista Social Club had just come out. And those people were his peers. I mean, Almada, they, they came up together. In fact, he was probably a little bit older. He was part of that feeling movement, but he was a senior guy. He was one of those innovators then, you know, and he wasn't. You know, and he, but he had left in 55. So in many ways, this film is about those who left. Maybe if we look at Buena Vista Social Club or the people who stayed behind and we get to, you know, and these were people that left, you know, and I really became, that, that journey was really interesting to me. So, uh, but the dynamic going back to the thing you said about the recording, it was difficult because he hadn't done it for 20 years and he was rusty and there, were, there was tension because there was not that much time or that much money to get everything done in one day. And he's not, his talent is, isn't something you can harness very easily. So in the rehearsal, everything was very loose and free. Joey and he were connected very close together. It was, it was the way he worked so well, improvisationally. And then the technical stuff starts to take over in the recording studio. So that took a little while, but I remember the breakthrough. And the breakthrough's in the film with, uh, it's called Descarga, uh, it's called, uh, it's called uh, uh, Descarga, it's California Jam Session. California Jam Session. They just came alive and everybody was, uh, I mean it was like, and then after that, he was, he was on his way, and it was like unstoppable. I mean, I, I got to, I mean, there's little pieces of what he did with me on the street, and he would go for half an hour. If I told him to do a mambo, I mean, he was a one-man orchestra. He was showing you the arrangement, just, and it tells me, without a doubt, his greatest performances, and there's some good ones in this film, his greatest performances were probably never captured because he was performing all the time, you know, and it was just music was just coming out of him, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Tenemos tiempo para... Time for one final question. Yeah, this gentleman here who asked for the floor. Hi. Question is for you, Matt. First of all, congratulations, because I believe you reflect the spirit, the free spirit of this fascinating man, by the way. And um, my question is a bit more personal. I'd like to ask you whether you keep any, you remember anything of any specific conversations, I imagine there are many, but any specific conversation that you had with Fayove that you keep remembering up until the present moment, perhaps. Thank you. For me, as I, I had said earlier, when he shared, well, you know, he shared with me things about uh, his background of being uh, being black in Cuba, you know, at, at that time. You know, the discrimination that existed there. And, you know, and he shared that with me. In fact, that he was, he said, I'm 100% black. My background is African and, and, um, and uh, you know, he talked a little bit about how difficult that was at times because there was a degree of racism then. And not just that, but he also talked about the style of, uh, there was that. And then the other personal things that I remember was him talking about how he wasn't readily accepted Oh, of course, by his colleagues in the feeling movement, the other artists, but the mass public, the feeling, and, and, and the majority of those artists, they weren't really accepted right away in the beginning. And that's why so many of them left to, to go to Mexico. And Mexico was the trampoline for success. And they di discrimination didn't exist there in the same way, in any way that I, I mean, I'm sure, listen, the world is round, okay? but. But they were accepted, and I think that re is reflected by the the artists that I spoke to who were there. And I, I remember there were obviously there were a lot of things in interviews that I couldn't put into the film. But Dandy Beltran shared with me a story about how it, in the '50s he and the great um, composer and comedian Zamorita were both black, uh, Afro-Cubano, you know, and they were that they went to a nightclub in, in Havana and uh, they were turned away because, with the co because they were black. And Tintan was with them, the great Mexican comedian. Tintan became so angry and he, he argued with them, with the doorman, and then as they walked away, he said, I'm bringing you guys to Mexico because this doesn't, not gonna exist for you there. You know, you'd be accepted. And, and that's the experience that I found, the artist who lived there, it was harder, I think, for an, the artists that did come from abroad in Mexico when they got older, like Feove, especially the ones who had no family, you know. I think that was tougher, so. But in general, they were accepted with great kindness in Mexico. That was what I was, was shared with me mm -hmm. by Feove and others, yeah. Okay. Bueno, eh, okay, unfortunately, We'd be glad to listen to Matt Dillon and uh, the rest of the people involved in the, in the film, but they've got a tight agenda, and then you've got a, the screen, the film later, so thank you. I want to thank you very much for being here, by the way, and best of luck with the film. Thank you.